Who wants feedback? Yeah. Sort of. That's pretty good. But uh, feedback is just an electronic signal that's provided to the control system that controls the operation of the system, right? So it's just a, it's just an electronic or electrical. Yeah, that would be just as well. Uh, but it's either going to be a, a voltage representation or it's going to be a current representation uh, that we uh, that provides information to the control system as to things about the process, right? So temperature. So you got a perfect feedback system in your house if you got a thermostat on your wall. That's a feedback system. So feedback, uh, basically what we do is we establish a reference point, right? You understand? So that's what you're doing. Set, set point reference points are the same terminology. Mm -hmm. So you establish a reference point. So you go to your thermostat and you set a temperature. And then what does it do? Then it use, utilizes the feedback to determine if that thermostat is at the right temperature. If it's not at the right temperature, then it generates an error and causes either your air conditioner to turn on or your heater to turn on or your air conditioner to turn off or your heater to turn off, depending on what you have, right? You understand? <clears throat> now I have a programmable thermostat. So what I can do is I can go in and program my set and you can program it for a certain time. So mine has four set points that I can set up uh, for both my heat and my air conditioning. So now once I got my set point, I don't have to go in there and constantly do uh, just my thermostat because I programmed the set points in, which is pretty neat. So uh, they have them now though, uh, but I still have to switch between heat and cold on mine. Uh, they have them now where it'll automatically either select heat or not automatically select cold to set a certain temperature. So you can say 74 degrees and it would keep it 74 degrees in the summertime or what? The wintertime without you actually going and switching between heat, it decides what? It decides the best route to go. Uh, which is the kind of the system they run here at the, in the A building. Basically, they run boilers and chillers all along. And, and the vents have, uh, the actual vents or the ductwork actually runs heat up one side and cold down the other. And, and then it's got a vane that they control that they decide how much cold we get and how much what heat we get, which is a pretty neat system. Mm -hmm. I don't know. You'd have to ask the people. It, it probably, probably not, but that was the route that they went. You know, now, used to, uh, last time I talked to them, they said that they run both of them. Uh, they got in, they got into a while where, I don't know if they're doing that now, where they only ran one system. And the problem is, is that uh, when we'd have cold days, we'd freeze to death until they did what? Uh, decided to up, to switch over, or if it was, got too hot. So we had problems in changing the seasons. You know, so when seasons changed, you have some cold, cold days and you have some warm days. It's, they were doing that for a little while, but I, I had noticed that. In a, in a while. So uh, uh, let me bring up my camera software. Uh, we got our little encoder motors in, our servo motors, excuse me. So what's a servo motor? Yeah, internally. So we don't have to we don't have to hook a sensor up to it. It has the whatever it has, like the little uh, ones I showed y'all the other day. I didn't bring my bag out. I need to go get it. Has an internal tech generator. And it had four wires coming out of it. The ones we got uses uh, incremental encoders, quadrature encoders, which are basically a version of an incremental encoder. And what is a quadrature encoder? It's also called a two channel. Yeah, so uh, we can use the encoders for several different things. It would take a computer, by the way, to do position. You know, the uh, 
the S twelve hundreds, Siemens S twelve hundreds we have actually supports a quadrature encoder. Uh, I need to do a little research on that to figure out if we can use that to establish a position. And so right now all we'll do is just direction and speed. So here's our little here's the here's the encoder motors, and it's a internal internally geared motor. So the motor is actually here, and then this is the Hall effect. Uh, this uses a Hall effect quadrature encoder, and what the Hall Hall effects do? They sense a lot magnetic magnetic field. So uh, this is, I'll, I'll figure out later on how to get the cover off, but we can actually take the cover off and see the encoder itself. So the encoder's back here, here's the motor, and here's the gearbox. Now when I read the uh, specifications, or when I reached and looked on it, it said the gear ratio was 131.5 to 1. But the specification says 131 to 1. Well, we'll, we'll just take that. So that means uh, for every... 131 turns of the encoder, we get one turn of the output. Now the encoder uh, gives us the pins. Uh, if we count one pulse, uh, let's say we count from rising edge to rising edge, then that's what we'll do. That, and there's 32 pulses per, or 32 pulses per revolution. But we also, on a PLC, we can say that to not only count the rising edges and the falling edges, if we count both rising edges and falling edges, then that would be 64 pulses per revolution. But let's use 32. Okay, that way, that's what we've seen before. So what would the, what would the transfer ratio be? Thirty-two revolution pulses per revolution back here. But what we're trying to do is we're trying to set the speed here, right? You understand this is the output. So what we're doing is we're going through a gearbox. So we've got to figure out the ratio of not what's going on here is what's going on there, right? You understand? So how many pulses per revolution would we see if the ratio of the gear is 131 to 1? Okay. Then what would the what would the pulses be? Per, what would the pulses would we get? Per revolution of the output shaft. So, what would we do, guys? <clears throat> So 32 pulses per revolution on the motor. So that's what they say, PBR, which would be pulses per, and they, or you might see P slash R for per. So pulses per revolution, That's on the motor, right? You understand? So if the motor makes one revolution, we get 32 pulses. But to get the output shaft to turn one revolution, we got to turn the input. We got the motor's got to turn 132 times. So what would be our pulses per revolution for the output shaft? What would y'all think we would do? Huh? Right, but yeah, but what we got to do is we, we know the out and we know the in and what we're trying to do is the center, right? You understand? So what do we need to do? Well, what we first we're going to do is we're going to take 32 and we're going to multiply it by 131 and that's our, that's our transfer function. So our pulses per revolution on the output shaft would equal to what? 4192, 4192. Are we okay? Now, now we know. Now, now we can do our transfer function, right? You understand? Are we okay? So, now we know this. 
This is pulses per revolution. Right? You understand. Okay. So now we can come up here and we can run the thing. And then we can come up here and look at our oscilloscope. I don't want to do that. Now you won't let me, won't let me do anything. I should have done this. My camera's not focusing. So uh, the leading edge or the rising edge is right here. I'm going to turn my scope down one notch so we can see one, one revolution. And you can see, hopefully, you can see uh, this is one of the this is this is channel one, sometimes called the A channel. This is channel two, coming off our quadrature encoder. So what we can see right off the bat, they're, they're 90 degrees up there, right? So this indicates what direction we would go. So if channel one leads to channel two, or channel A leads to channel B, then that means we're rotating in the clockwise direction. And that's something we would have to figure out. So the time we have here, we have our scope set on 0.1 milliseconds per division, or 100 microseconds per division, right? Scopes don't use the legal engineer notation, by the way. So we got one, two, three, four, five point two division. Yeah, or, or hundred microseconds. What we should say is hundred microseconds. But but most of our test equipment use engineering notation, but it doesn't use correct engineering notation, right? Understand? To reduce the number of ranges. Does that make sense? So this scope's only got, it's got seconds, it's got milliseconds, and uh, I don't think it's got, but it's got microseconds. Now the problem why it doesn't do it is it jumps in ones, twos, and fives. So I don't know if y'all can, uh, I need to go back to my turn turn in real slow? Turn real slow. The motor's turning real fast. The gearbox is turning outside of the gearbox is turning real slow. Well, you can see it, but you're out, you're on the other side of the gearbox. But when you hear it, what you're doing is you're hearing the motor, and the motor's running fairly fast. It's definitely a torque converter. So the 4192. Yeah, that's the Go ahead. It's making how many revolutions? That's what we're fixing to figure out. We don't, we don't know that yet, Jimmy. All we know is our encoder. So what we're doing is I'm not concerned with how fast the motor's running. So our encoder's back here. Then we have a motor. Then we have a gearbox. And this is the guy that does the work right there. Okay, you understand. So for every revolution that the motor turns, I get 4,192 pulses over here out of the encoder. For this to make one RPM. Right? You understand that? So now that we know that, then we can figure our what we call our transfer function. Right? You understand? And what's our formula? We have two that we looked at. So RPM would be equal to what? Uh, your frequency over your number of yeah. Right, times sixty out here, right? So this is going to be the number, so this is going to be 4,196 times the frequency, right? And then we take the reciprocal of that, and then multiply it by 60, and that will give us our RPM. But this is what we're doing over here. So even over here, we're getting 32 pulses per revolution. Over here, we're getting 4,192 pulses per revolution, right? You understand the difference? 
So where's the work going from? Here's the working end right there. That's what we're concerned with the speed. We're not concerned with how fast the motor's running. We're out. We're we're trying to figure out how fast the output shaft is working. So what we did is we we definitely this is what we call a torque converter. So what happens is that if we reduce speed, since work in and work out are equal, right? You understand that? And basically, work is equal to speed times distance or speed. So what we're saying is that if we if we increase speed, we're going to lose torque because we got to come up with basically the same answer. That's if this was 100% efficient. Uh, of course, what's going to happen is the work we get out is going to be le actually less than the work we put in, right? You understand that? And that's why we don't have what we call perpetual motion. We don't have perpetual motion because everything we do is going to eventually going to slow down right if we had perpetual motion it means once we got something in motion it would do uh stay in motion. on earth uh, they almost that. achieved that in space and why do they almost achieve that in space zero gravity, zero gravity no friction we have no friction in space but down here we no matter what we do we have friction so we always have losses in the system <laughs> on motors we hadn't measured it yet. I'm sorry. You're you're in AC. You're measuring frequency on the oscilloscope. So what we're going to do is we're going to measure time. Our so our oscilloscope. What are what this oscilloscope gives us? Now we do have digital oscilloscopes that will measure that will display frequency. They don't measure frequency. They calculate frequency. Everybody understand because of did. Most digital uh, oscilloscopes are computers. And one thing computers could definitely do is the computer can definitely do math. Right, you understand? Uh, so on digital oscilloscopes, you can usually tell it to display the frequency, and it'll pop up down at the bottom and give you the frequency. But it's still calculating that from what? From time. Right, you understand that? So when we came up here on an oscilloscope, we measured, what, what did we measure? 5.2 divisions. So I'm going to come up here and I'm going to take 5.2 positions. And I'm going to multiply that by 100 microseconds. Miss what? 520 microseconds. Then we take the reciprocal of that, and that'll give us the frequency. So what's our frequency? 19 what? 23. So this is our frequency. This will be in hertz. You okay, Gary? Where'd you get the 100 microseconds? We got it off the speed of the scope. Okay. Uh, okay. okay. So if you come up here and look, if you want to come up here and look. No, I know. I know what I'm so we got the speed of the scope, and then we took that and multiplied that by the number of divisions, right? That you gave can us see it on the scope. It's seconds. Microsecond. Because we got 0.1 millisecond, and like I said, test equipment, so so scopes go in, in, in units to, to decrease the number of ranges. It's just like your meter. And if they go in certain units, it means besides tens, it means you're, you're going to get illegal engineering notation. So most scopes goes in one, twos, and fives. So if I come up here on my voltage setting right now, if it's, uh, I can get this close enough you can see it. Let's see, here's my volts per division on this channel. And if I start turning it, notice it goes 1, 0 0.5, 0 0.2, 0 0.1. So it goes 50, 20, 10 millivolts. So what happens on your oscilloscope 
is to, to limit the number of ranges. It, it, it usually but most of them moves in ones, twos, and fives. Our digital telescope goes ones, twos, 2.5, so it's kind of weird. Uh, it makes it a little harder. Because most of y'all in high school learn how to count in what? Ones, twos, and fives, right? You understand? That? So, I mean, if I wanted to come up here and measure the amount of voltage, I could come up here and I could do it without using a set. So I got two volts per division. That would be two. That would be four. And half of that would be five volts. So, I can measure, once you learn an oscilloscope, you can measure it without, without using a calculator. Because we all can count in ones, twos, and fives, right? You understand? Uh, the way they normally teach is to count the number of divisions and then do what? And then multiply it by the speed. Now, if I'm counting the number of divisions, we have five minor divisions between each major line. So that means each one of those is worth a point two. So I came over here and I said one, two, three, four, five. There's one minor division, so I said five point two, right? You understand that? Five point two times this speed right here. And then that gives me the time. Then I can take the reciprocal of time, and that gives me the what? Frequency. So what speed do we have, guys? So we got 1,223. We're going to multiply that times our frequency, which is what? I'm sorry. Our, we're going to multiply that times uh, 4,196. Then we're going to do what? Reciprocal, and then multiply that times six. Which should be pretty slow. So what speed we got? Maybe micro. So we're doing something wrong. You understand we our speed cannot be micro, right? You understand that? Why is that? Because I'm sitting here making I'm watching this thing turn and if it was Yeah. And I can come up here and just about count. I could get a stopwatch right here and I can just about count RPM. So I could set my time, I could every time the flat side comes around I could count it and I could just about count the RPM. Y'all understand why the answer can't be right? Y'all understand why the answer, why you understand why the answer can't be right? Well, no. <laughs> but you can sit here and you can count, if you sit, is this making more than one revolution per minute? Yes or no? Can y'all yes, see it? Yes. Okay. So it can't be many revolutions right off the bat. I yeah. could come over here and I could put my stopwatch on this thing and I could count the number of revolutions in 60 seconds and I could almost guarantee it's going to be probably around 100 or so, right? You understand? Yes or no? Huh? So what are we doing wrong? Well, I'm looking at What's that? 27.5 RPM looks about right. I would thought it would be more than that. Let's count. What we'll do is I'll put my stopwatch on it and count it for 10 seconds. And that give us a rough idea. So 10 seconds, then we'll multiply that by 6, right? And we'll see how accurate we are. It, it'll give us close. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen, twenty, twenty-one, twenty-two, twenty-three. Four, no. Sorry. Oh, I 
I can't even say maybe. <laughs> I finally looked at my watch. Okay, so we'll do it again. They say, good gracious. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, <laughs> ten, eleven. So about eleven. But sixty six RPM, right? Or close to it. Twenty seven. Rising air to rising air. What was our frequency? Absolutely, it's something. What was our time? Twenty what? There wasn't like a point five or something like that. Huh? Uh huh. Okay, let's do 520 microseconds. What's that? Thank you. Okay, so let's do it the way uh, the 520. That's per revolution, right? I mean, per. Per revolution. So for one revolution, we divide that. What's our number? 5,092. 4192. So what would that give me? Take the reciprocal of that, right? That's gonna give us a huge number, though. Huh? What's that?
We'll come up with a small one. If we multiply by 60, what do we come here? Was that? No, we're doing something. I can't. I can't remember. So we need to make sure we take care of this. But we need to figure out what we're doing wrong. Now we got the transfer function. What we're trying to do is we're trying to figure out the actual speed relative to time, right? That would be the pulses per revolution. And they don't give you the number of blades. What they do is they give you the number of uh, they give you the number of pulses per revolution. Huh? Oh, okay, so we got the formula backwards. I should have transposed it. Times times the number of teeth, the reciprocal times 60. Let's do this one. So it's the measured frequency. So what was our measured frequency? Divided by the number of pulses per revolution. Now I need to change that. It's going to be on the output shaft. It's not going to be. It's not going to be 32 because the output shaft don't see it as 32. The output shaft sees it as 4,192 pulses per revolution. Hmm. And I counted 11 in 10 seconds, I think. So let's use uh, 64 times 132. I mean, I'm sorry, 64 times 131. What does that give you? 21? Okay, so let's use that in this formula. Huh? That's going to be the measured frequency is going to be the same, but for number of pulses per revolution, we're going to use that, and that's going to make it go down. Uh, yeah, that's what it would come up with. 
So the 2700, uh, well, I'm sorry, 27 what? Okay, 27.5 revolution per minute. Which is probably right. I mean, this is something. And it is 32. But well, what they're saying, if we set up a counter that could count both the rising and the falling edges, it would, it would count as 64, right? That makes sense. And of course, we could see, uh, as the speed goes up, uh, now what I'm going to do, I need to, I need to get the focus thing. So if the speed goes up, time goes down, right? Frequency goes up. This is a 12 volt motor. And they say if I put 12 volts on it, it should turn around 80 RPM. And of course, if the speed goes down, then the time goes up, right? So if time goes up, frequency goes down, so they're opposite each other. Are you okay there? Uh, now, right now, A, A is leading B. So if I come up here and change the direction, this guy's going to be hard to do. What we should do is we should see B, uh, A trailing B, right? Oops. Oh, I'm sorry. This ain't gonna work with this solar space. Why it's not going to work with the soul shows is the, uh, we're getting a repetitive waveform. But we can't see the phase shift within the soul show. So what we have to do is we have to synchronize the waveform. We have to synchronize the oscilloscope with the signal it's trying to measure. We all that hadn't used an oscilloscope before. So what we got is we got a repetitive waveform. Let's do the this and let us look at one signal. And then I'll show you all this on the oscilloscope. Now, what would happen is that if I don't reference it to the waveform, my, well, the way the scope works is it comes across from left to right, and then it resets itself, and then it comes off left to right at a certain rate. Everybody understand that? Well, the problem is if we don't synchronize it, We have it, and the scope is out, what we say, it's out of sync.
So this, you can actually see now the scope is out of sync. So what happens when it resets over to the left, if we don't tell it, if we don't give it a reference point on the signal, then it just goes ahead and sends it across. So the analogy we use, and I can't show you all this in the video, but the analogy we use will be, see I do something like this. And if I don't come up here and reference it to a point, this is what I'm looking at, right? Does that make sense? So what we do is we call it the trigger on the scope. And then what we can do on the trigger is we can set it to look at a certain amplitude, either going up towards the top or coming down. And then we can set the amplitude to where we want it to synchronize the scope at. And we refer to that as the trigger. Some of your smart scopes can automatically choose the trigger for you. Some of your drummer scopes, uh, you have to come in and you have to actually set the trigger. But one thing that we have to do uh, is we have to establish which one is the reference. So on mine, I've established on oscilloscope we have to we have to establish a reference. Here's my trigger right here. You know, see this? Huh? So every scope is about the same. So here's my trigger. And we have to select what edge we want to reference it to. So I've got mine referenced on the positive edge, right? And then this right here is where we set the level. Uh, I would like to show you the digital scope because this digital scope puts a line up there that actually shows you the trigger, um, the, trigger the actual trigger level. Then we have to, then we have to choose a channel. So I'm saying, okay, I'm looking at the ch channel uh, one on the wall, on the rising edge. So it don't make any difference which one's out of phase. Uh, channel one will always be over here on the left. So with the oscilloscope, I can't see the, the phase yet. Does that make sense? Because channel one is it's always going to start with channel one, no matter how the encoders are working. So I'll have to figure out a way, way to do that. If I did change the direction of the motor, but it's real hard. Uh, now I could come up here and fake it and tell it to look at channel two. And then now channel, now channel two is leading channel one. But what I did is I changed my reference, right? And, uh, for my soul stuff. So it would be kind of, uh, difficult to see the actual shift between the two phases with it. So, because we've always got a reference to trigger on Y on one channel, on one end. I'm saying, okay, this this will always be on the left. Well, I'll try to figure out how to do that. Are we okay? So, but what could we tell if we could figure that out? Now, the PLC has the, the, uh, the Siemens PLC supports a quadrature encoder, and I'll see how, uh, I'll play around with that this weekend figure out how to actually program it. So not only can we get, uh, get direction, uh, we can also get speed. Uh, take a little time to figure out how to make it, how to do position, but that would be interesting too. Okay, so what do we mean by level sense? Now we're not talking about when something is uh, flat, so we call those things levels, right? Uh, you use that to determine. Uh, I've got uh, an application on my phone where I can uh, actually measure if something's level or not level. What we're doing uh, with a level sensor is we're looking at the the height of liquids, right? the height of something. Much what? Yeah, that's what we're talking about. It, it, it basically is it's referencing the height of something to some reference point, right? So our 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 sensor on our 
on most of our automobiles. Uh, most of them have a analog sensor on them, right, which gives us what? Level. And then most of them have a digital sensor on it, or it might have a, a unit inside the, the, the engine control module that takes analog and converts it to digital. And now most of our cars beep at us. So mine comes up and dings at me a couple of times. And then on the display below my stairwell, it says low fuel, which means I better start the alarm. Look if we can Huh? <laughs> the, uh, the Harley. Uh, my my Honda Shadow, I had a Honda Shadow motorcycle, and it would come up with a big nice red light saying fill up. The Harley, you'd be riding along and your, it would start sputtering. You had to reach down on your, on your left hand side and change over to the lower tank. So the way that motorcycle is set up, it's got it's got a baffle in there and it's got a low tank and a high tank. And when it drops down below a certain level, uh, then it'll come up and give you that warning, right? I mean, it'll start sputtering on you, and then you need to do what? You turn that valve. Well, guess what you would forget to do when you fill up? Turn the valve back. And you'd see oh, Harley, oh, oh, you'd see oh, Harley, oh. like every once in a while, they'd be on the side of the road, they'd run out of gas, because it, they had it set right on that valve, and when it sputtered, they flipped it over to their reserve, then they went and filled up and left it on the wall, the reserve, and then they run out of gas. Did I ever do that? Yeah. Once. Yes. Uh, I may have done it years ago. But. You learned, but the, I, what I liked about the Honda, it had that low fuel light that would come on and let you know. So it didn't have a reserve. And that was a, that was precarious, guys. If you was in a, leaned into a turn and your motorcycle started sputtering on you. So that would happen because the, the gas would shift in the tank. Anyway. Of, uh, motorcycle riders. I guess I don't know if Harley still does that or not. Like I said, I don't. Know. Yeah. I don't know why I've got eight down here. Let me look at the review to make sure. We're supposed to have a test Thursday, right? So it looks like the, the PowerPoint might be out of order. Now we might just, I don't think we're going to get through level sensors, we'll see. So the next is load sensors. So what's a load? A sensor. What's a what's a load? What would a load sensor be sensing? Weight. Weight. Yeah. So mm -hmm. how we're going to sense weight? How weight that? Yeah, yeah, well that that that's the unit that does it. Well, yeah. so how we're going to sense? How we're going to sense weight? That's what we're trying to do. What type of sensor would we, what we would think? Conveyor belt. <laughs> so we're over here. What have we done so far? Position. We've done position. Uh, we've done proximity. Uh, we've done speed. And now we're going to deal with weight or force sensors. So we have bonded weight. First of all, we can we can sense weight with levers, right? You understand levers? They all got you know understand levers. Are we okay on levers? So what we can do is uh, we can have a lever, and a, a lever is basically a plane or something that's and it uh, rests on a center point called a fulcrum, right? Yeah, I've, never, I've never heard that. So we start off with some type of, usually it's, uh, and then we come up here, and then we put a, a point like this. 
Ah, this is called Fulcrum. I don't know. I'm, I think I'm spelling it wrong. And then what we do is we come over here and it's force and distance. So you can see right off the bat, uh, if I move this one, this one is going to move in the opposite direction, but it's going to move a smaller distance, right? You understand? So what I've done is I've reduced and it's going to move at a slower speed. So if speed goes down and distance goes down, then force goes up, right? You understand that? So what we can do, and there are several ways you can do that, but if this was six feet, and then this right here over is two feet, if I put a hundred pounds over here, a half pounds of force over there, then I would be generating two hundred pounds of force over there at half the speed. You don't understand that? Yes or no? So it's basically you just take the output over the input. And it means this guy over here would be would be half the speed and two times the force. You understand that? So if speed goes down, force goes up. So we can position that sensor. And if you ever did on a seesaw, you was on a class one lever. If you was on a seesaw, that's a bad though. Huh? A seesaw. And what you would do is if you had a heavy guy person on one end. And Usually had about three or four positions where you could shift the fulcrum at, so the big big guy wouldn't hold you up in the air all the time. Even though some of y'all did that, right? Yeah. So I keep it sitting. Or if you was the heavy person, you raise up real high, and then you'd pick up your feet real fast and shoot the other person off if they wasn't holding on to the handles. And then you'd apologize for that. Right? F U L. What's F U L? I don't know how I come up with that. So what we can do with this is we can use lever systems where I come over here and I put a big old truck over here and through levers, it moves a little pointer over here, maybe generating one or two pounds of force, right? It moves real slow. So the first uh, truck scales that I got involved with were analog scales. They were actually lever scales. But it would be impossible to take this and translate it into into a control system because it doesn't give me a voltage output. Y'all use levers all the time. A class two lever. Uh, I need. We got three classes. I need to go back and study that. Uh, your fulcrum is down here, and then your weight or your weight is here, and then and what happens here is it's the same thing. You would measure the distance between here and the center of the weight and the distance between here and the center of the weight and that would be your force multiplier. So I had my lawnmower down at my son's house and um, he's got a section of, of, of uh, his yard that collects water but you can't see it because of the grass and I pulled my lawnmower in there and it it's a riding lawnmower and it got stuck. And I got off that thing and I pushed it and I could not make it budge. So I went and found me a big old two by four. Right here, I sunk this into the ground so that it became my lever. My lawnmower back hit up about on this side and I was way back and I pushed it myself. I pushed that one up. I had to do it in infinite because I was over here doing this, right? So I was doing a lot of distance and my lawnmower was only coming up just enough to move the top. So we can use levers to get a mechanical advantage. But the problem is, is I if I wanted to sense the force that's required, I'm gonna have to have something that takes what a force and converts it over to either a current or a voltage. Makes sense. So we got several methods uh, I could do. You know, I could. Uh, I could use pressure. So if I've got a big tank that's full of a liquid and I know its specific gravity, then I can literally come down here at the very bottom and put a pressure sensor. Because the pressure now would be proportional to the weight. Right? Does that make sense? So we got pressure sensors, which we'll look at later on. What we're going to look here is, is the two main uses that we have. And the first one we have is what they call a, we know that, and we know this, 
Uh, we're going to look at what we call a bonded wire strangle. Now, what determines the resistance of a conductor? Some of you already know that we covered that in quite a few classes. Number one would be the what? You know, the material. And number two would be the size. Number three would be the what? Length. And number four is the what? So this is the way a strain gauge works. It works on these two principles right here. Changing the size and also changing the volume. Yeah. And then we gotta figure out what to do about this. Everybody understand? And then we have semiconductor force sensor. What determines the resistance of a conductor, the material, the gauge, or the size, the length, and the temperature? So this is what we do with a with a strain gauge. It's basically nothing but a wire that two terminals on it, and then it's just a little wire. You understand? Now what happens when we apply a force to this thing? It's either going to stretch it. I understand if it stretches it, what's going to happen to the wire? They're going to get thinner. And they're going to get what? Smaller. Which means the resistance is going to change. If we compress it, then the wires are going to get shorter and they're going to get fatter. Which means the resistance of the strain gauge goes down. And these guys are extremely accurate. The only thing we got to do is compensate for what? temperature because if the resistance goes up with temperature and I'm using this guy to buy my groceries off of <laughs> right you understand and they're weighing fruit then we would get different measurements for the uh, temperature so how can I compensate for a change of temperature what type of unit would you use what type of electrical circuit would you use to compensate for temperature we so we come up with a weak stone bridge where we can actually so what we do is we always you normally use these things in pairs they do this a lot of buildings especially buildings that's that uh, has a lot of fascia it really surprised me people don't understand that big tall buildings bend. they have to with wind if you think about the surface of those things and the wind pushing against that thing they, they bend uh, so there's a lot of buildings that have these things mounted on the, they're literally mounted on the, on the I beam. And when the I beams bend, it causes the strain gauge to either compress or collapse and they can measure the force on the building. Now, there's one with building. I can't remember where it's at. It's really neat. They got a big old pendulum up in the very top. Big old pendulum up in the very top. And it uses that to swing in different directions to compensate for what? The tilt of the building, which is I've seen that some of those buildings move in such a Yeah, it's unbelievable. It's just by the wind. But you, you can't tell it, but they say a lot of times if you're up in the upper floors, you can literally watch. You can actually feel it. So, yeah, I think it might be Dubai. I'm not sure. It's somewhere. It's not It's not here. Might be, but they got a big pendulum and it's all the way up on the top floor. And literally, they use these strain gauges, and they shift that pendulum to shift the weight of the building to make uh, to make it stay pretty vertical. So what they do is they use these things in pairs. One of them is is, is in this way with the lower force. Now, what's going to happen with this guy? So this guy, this is the active gauge. So the active gauge is either going to compress or it's going to expand with the weight. This guy right here is going to act like an accordion, right? You understand? So I actually, it's going to move this way, so it's not going to change its size, right? You understand? This guy will change its size and force. So these guys, to get a real, real accurate measurement, we run these in pairs. One of them is called a compensation gauge. One of these is called the active gauge. Where's the compensation gauge? This is simply wrong. 
It's going to sense temperature, so it's resi- it's not going to change its length with weight. In fact, the way it's hooked, it's hooked uh, where it acts like an accordion, right? You understand? So this guy does not change its its resistance with weight. This guy changes its resistance with weight. This guy don't change its resistance with weight. This guy's temp- this guy changes with temperature. This guy changes with temperature. But they're mounted right there together on the same mount, so that means the temperature on both of them are exactly the same. So if this guy goes up one ohm, this guy goes up one, one ohm. And what happens, so we have our active gauge, we have our active gauge, we have our compensation gauge, and the ratio of these two guys all stay exactly the same for temperature. So if this goes up one ohm, this goes up one ohm, and the and the ratio stays the same, right? Does that make sense? Yeah, so this guy compensates for temperature. This guy, so let's say we 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 have exactly the same force, and uh, this guy here's got a hundred ohms. This guy here's got a hundred ohms. Temperature goes up. This goes up to a hundred, and the ratio is still perfect, right? You understand? This guy's up goes up to one hundred and one ohms. This guy goes up to what? One hundred and one ohms. So that means this guy stays balanced. If you put a force on there, this guy might go up to 201 ohms. This guy stays at 101 ohm, and now we would get an output indicating what the weight is at. Does that make sense? So the compensation gauge is in there to compensate for what? Temperature. The active gauge is in there to give you an output that is proportional to the force that's been put on. So we have these things called strain gauges. This is a strain gauge. Yeah, that's right. So if you ever looked at the the, the print of a, scan, a a strain gauge, this is it right here. And then this is not in there. And they have, they have two wires coming out. Uh, this is going to be for what they call the excitation doses. And then you're going to have two wires coming out, and this is going to be your this is going to be a, a voltage that represents your weight. And then this output, and you're saying, well, it's going to weigh the weigh bridge. Well, what you do is you compensate for the weigh bridge inside the indicator. You understand what I'm saying? Yes or no? So if I'm getting five volts out of here, so it's like you're in the old days. Uh, and I need to bring an analog meter in here. In the old days, uh, what we would do is before we we took ohms, is we would come up here and we would put our uh, we would put our meter leads together, and then we'd turn the dial until it measured zero. So what I did is I set zero manually, right? You understand that? I got one. Yeah, I got it too. Uh, no, we're okay. I think we got one on here. So what we do is if, if, if the way bridge, if the way bridge, by, y'all know what we mean by the way bridge. That's the guy that's sitting out there that you put stuff on. So we don't put stuff on the strain gauge, right? You understand? We gotta have some type of surface up there that we put our, that put our devices on. And then the strain gauge would be, or the load cell. We call these load cells, by the way. So this is the load cell right here. The load cell has the weak stone bridge built into it. It has four wires coming out of it. One is for the excitation voltage. That's where you put your vote, your DC volts at, right? You understand? And it's got to be a real good regulated power supply. Because if your AC, if your DC excitation voltage changes, then your scale, the output of your scale goes down. The other two wires will get out. This is going to be the actual uh, signal wires. These wires are going to be give us a voltage for, for weight, but we got the weight bridge over. Well, let's say with the weigh bridge over here on the output, I get I get plus five volts. Well, what I do is I just tell my scale that plus five volts equals what? Zero. We just zero it out. And there's still some functions I've seen even on digital where you see you can zero things out. Uh, most of your di- most of your meters don't do that. Anymore. Most of your digital meters don't do that. Anymore. Well, uh, even on a scale. Uh, we could we could take out the tear, uh, which would be uh, you pull a truck on there that's empty, and then you zero it out, 
and then they go back and fill up, and then they come back and weigh, and it gives you the weight of the material. Now, we, we didn't make that available to the truck drivers at U.S. Steel. What they would do is they had a printer, and they would pull their empty truck up on the scale, and they would print off a ticket. And it would show what the tear of their of their vehicle was, and then they'd go either load or unload, and you'd come back and weigh the second time, uh, and then it would give them it would give them a number, and the next time it would actually print out their 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 tear their tear instead of their gross. Huh? Yeah, tear. Each ladle they weigh. Yeah. Yeah, they're coming in and zero out, but because the problem with ladles is they get they get steel on the inside, and then. Uh, yeah, you have to you have to come in and zero it out, and then you're wearing what they call the tear and not the what, not the gross. So yeah, almost your scales have a zero button on them. So what you're doing is you're establishing what zero is, right? So that's what we would do when we when we change the load cell out. We would reset. We would come in. Uh, we would come in, and then we would uh, put zero weight on there and we'd zero the scale, then we'd come in and we'd put calibrated weights on there. They had to be checked every year. We had to take them, we had to haul them down to Montgomery and they had to make sure they were calibrated according to a standard. Especially if you buy and sell off your scales. And then they, we would put a certain amount of weight on there. And then we'd say that's the amount of weight and then we'd reset zero and then we'd, you had to do it about three times to set what we call the span of the scale. And once you got the span of the scale set, then and then most scales have what they call an auto zero circuit on it, which means every once in a while, because what happens with big truck scales is what? You get debris on the scales all the time. So what they would do is that there was no motion on the scale. So they had motion sensors on there. So if the scale started moving, it wasn't zero. If the scale wasn't moving, then it was zero every so often. You would just read it for zero to take out. So they bought an electric scale out of U.S. Steel and guess what picture they didn't get on it? Auto zero. I don't know if it's still out there. Is that the lime scale? So I designed the circuit to auto zero. Learned a lot. So these guys are very, so this is the load tail right here. This is not part of the load tail. This comes from the, from the indicator. You understand? So your indicator has the your indicator has the power supply in it that actually supplies the excitation voltage for the for the, it's usually around ten volts. So this is, so the Wheatstone bridge is inside the so a, a load cell is a combination of your strain gauges and then it has the uh, actually has the Wheatstone bridge inside the thing. It, it amazed me that. I mean, we had some 800 ton scale. Yeah. That, here's, here's, here's the load set. Here's the metal. And this was a big chunk of metal that came all the way down inside that thing. And these big old trains would pull up on that and it would literally cause that, that big chunk of steel to flatten out, right? And then the load cells were mounted on the side. It amazed me that, that when I took these things apart, the actual thing that the load cells were mounted on. So uh, this was, I forgot what this is called. This was called a split beam, I think. So the load cell was actually mounted on here. And then what you do is you mount this side would be mounted and then your load would mount on here on that side. And what that would do is it would cause the metal to be what? To warp. And then of course if it warps and you got your load cell and your, your strain gauge in there, it would warp and it would change the position. And actually, you can actually see the, where they put the load. This is the way it's rated, by the way. So, uh, your excitation voltage for this guy would be what? 10, 10 volts, DC. And then we have the output. Huh? It was the output. It's usually a millivolt per volt. Yeah. So this is two millivolts per boat. Okay, so what that means if it's a hundred pound scale and you put a hundred pounds on it, it would give you two hundred millivolts. So these guys had to be pretty pretty accurate. So this is the rating. 
you know, vote per vote. And what's that is, that's on the execution vote. Does that make sense? Yes. And then the sales will be rated at a certain way. What's the way this is rated? We we had a raise in uh, pounds. What did I say? We had we had eight thousand pounds. I, I said that we had eight thousand pound scales, which would be four tons. And a railroad track, track well, on a railroad scale, what you do is you put four of them under there, at least four, maybe maybe six. You always use them in pairs. You you either use one of them or use them in pairs, right? Does that make sense? And then the weight was distributed out above them, and then they were summed together. Uh, that's just a link to some more information on that. I didn't check that out. Uh, this is another way we can measure force. This is called a calibrated spring. I don't have one of these in here. But you run into these all the time. You go down to Walmart, odds are uh, over there in the, uh, usually it's in the produce section. They'll have a dial indicator over there on the side where you can go over there and do uh, weigh your fruit. That's a calibrated spring. But what you're doing with that is that the weight of it is causing the, the spring to either a calibrated spring means that it's designed so it has it, it stretches a or compresses a, an exact amount when the force is applied to it. Yeah, when I went down there, that dial was already moved over. Two degrees. Now you probably could set a zero. That a zero adjustment on that did. Well, that, but anyway, I asked the produce guy that I said, "You're handicapping me from the start here." He said, "Oh no, no, it's accurate." I said, "Okay." Yeah, but this is what when you go when you go over there when you go over there to the register. This is what they weigh, this is what yeah. they weigh you. They weigh you on these uh, strain gauges. That's what it says. Yeah, so you don't pay for what that thing says. You pay what, for what it says when you go over to the cashier. Uh, used to, they had the scale off to the side, and now they integrate the scale right there in front of the register, uh, which is pretty neat. So uh, they come in, and they tap in a code, and it automatically gives them the price. Uh, it does that for them, right? Yeah, I always wondered about that. I always figured it was bad. But now we know it's that's all it is is strain gauges. It's got a strain gauge in there. And these guys are extremely accurate as long as they're calibrated. So what you do is you cal you have to calibrate them in a calibrated way. Uh, we had um uh, I forgot. I think we had fifteen thousand pounds worth of uh calibrated weight for our truck scales and then we had five pound weights and ten pound weights. We had counting scales, guys. You could go up there and, uh, you, know, you could go up there and you could uh, zero them out and calibrate them with a the weight. And then what you'd do is you'd put you'd put like 500 of these things on there and you'd weigh it. And then you'd tell the scale that was 500. And then you could come over and you could take one and you could put it on there and it would say. Yeah. <laughs> so you calibrate it with a known number, right? You understand? Which is pretty neat. If you had them in a bag, you'd put your bag on there first and zero it out. And then you put so many in there, and you made sure you counted those exactly. Uh, and it became very popular around the first of the year when everybody had to do inventory. We had counting scales we'd take out. We can combine a calibrated scale with something like a linear potentiometer or other devices. So a lot of our sensors, we have a mechanical sensing element, and then we use another sensor to actually give a voltage out that's proportional to our measure. That makes sense. So this would be an example of a calibrated spring measuring the actual force. Uh, this is using the spring in compression, and then we hook a rod up to a potentiometer, and then the voltage we get out of the potentiometer will now be a be part of our transfer function, right? Okay. So basically, we would ignore the spring, and we say, when I put five pounds on it, this guy right here would give me a certain voltage. But what we do a lot of times is we have a, it's just like a, 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 an incremental encoder. An incremental encoder by itself is nothing. Unless we do what? So we take another sensor and then use that. So this is a Holotech incremental encoder. So this guy right here is spinning magnets. 
and then we have an all effect that's that sits in the magnet. So we combine two, we combine another sensor with a something else that gives us the output, right? So we have optical incremental encoders. So what we're doing is we're combining uh, through the beam sensors that sense in those blades when they fly by, right? You understand? Uh, we have a variable reluctance uh, incremental encoders, which basically uh, senses metal tabs when they fly by. So a lot of our, our sensors, we have to we have to combine it with another sensor to get a, get a voltage or a current output, right? That makes sense. Uh, this is a resistive foam. Go ahead and take a break. Carbon. Carbon is a semiconductor, but it's kind of unique in that it's it varies its res resistance with compression. So the more we compress it, the less resistance it has. The less we compress it, the more resistance it has. Uh, for a long time, before we got semiconductor regulators, carbon pile regulators were actually what regulated generators. So they would have a, a solenoid on one end that if the voltage went up, it would pull the pile apart. So it's just a bunch of this. You can probably see them. I'm still there, still out there. Industry has a tendency not to change things that's uh, working. Common pile regulator. So if we got any images in here. So that's what they are. So it had just a bunch of uh, disc on it. And then it had a solenoid on one end. And what would happen is they were compressed together. And then it had a solenoid on one end. And when the uh, when the voltage on the output of the generator tried to go up, the solenoid would pull and would relieve the tension on the carbon pile, which would make its resistance would go up and would cause the output of the generator to go down. If the output of the generator tried to go down, the solenoid would put less pull on it. It would compress the the, uh, the carbon ring and cause the its resistance to go down. Would add more current to the uh, to the to the electromagnetic generator. So carbon pile regulators are around for years. This was the first method that we used to literally regulate generators. Made generators regulate. now it's all, of course, it's all electronic. All so what does regulation mean? Regulation. Yeah, in, in electronics, what is regulation. So it's not a law. So when we regulate something, so we have regulated power supplies, and what does that mean? Well, if you want to, uh, well, well, we want we, when we regulate, we don't want it to change. So the problem with with power supplies, people don't understand. Is there's there's nothing that has no resistance in it. So what would happen on a power supply if you put a load on it, guys? This output voltage would go down because of the internal resistance of the power supply. Unless we had some way we could compensate for that, right? You understand? So that's what a regulator does. A regulator maintains a constant output even with varying load conditions. So the way the way generators work is that if a load goes, if if it requires, if, if you put a load on a generator, the output voltage tries to go down. It puts more energy into the electromagnets that's generating that thing, which causes the output to do what? Go up. You got a regulator on. If you got a speed control on your car, it's a regulator. It's regulated, which means if your if your car tries to go down, if your speed tries to go down. It, it brings it back up, right? So you maintain, if it was perfect, you would maintain that exact speed, no matter if you was going uphill or if you was going downhill or you was running against a 100 mile an hour wind, it would still maintain the water. Speed. So regulation means we, we maintain a constant output with what? Varying conditions, normally low. Old cars. New cars. Have alternators. Uh, now, most most of the time, now the actual uh, regulator is is built into the altar, but they still have regulators on. If they didn't, that means when you turned on your air conditioner, your lights would dim. But I'm thinking about something like you're talking about. This is an external 
black. Yeah, some 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 cars still use external regulators, and then some cars use internal regulators. So it all depends on on the what type of car you got. So what we're doing here, guys, is this is my this is my this is my resistive foam. Oops, wrong okay. thing. I don't see my camera. Did I close my camera? I don't think I did. Okay. So all I've got is I've sandwiched a piece of resistive foam right here. This is the black. And then I've sandwiched it between two plates. And then I've connected to the metal plates. So I've got my own meter across the, the, the plates. And you can see when I press it, can you see what the ohms are doing? Yeah, you know, they're going down, and then when it keeps touching, so. So a very, very, very inexpensive technique that we can use to measure force. So I'm putting a force on here, right? Can you see what I'm doing? And then when I let it go, of course the resistance goes back up. Pretty neat little trick, right? So well, they're not extremely accurate, but what we're not, what we can do is we're not going to use this to buy and sell off of for years. And you can still run into old grocery stores out there, uh, where when they, when they first came up with automatic doors, they had rails and you had to step on a mat. You remember that? And well, yeah, there's still stores out there. Yeah, you, know, you can go to Highlander Food Center out in Utah and you do that. And then the door opens. You have to step on the mat. Now we, of course, we use mo most people use motion detectors, which are mounted above the thing. But you still get a, 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 a stores that's been around for a long time, especially grocery stores, where you have to step on a mat. Well, you come. We got. Uh, they call them pressure mats, where. We put them on, we, we open up the cell of the robot. We have the robot actually open because we can't put it inside a cage. And they put these pressure mats out there. So when you come up here and you step on one of these mats, what does it do? The robot stops, right? So uh, they're very, pre these guys are still really pre pre prevalent in robotics. And they're called pressure mats. But all you're doing is changing the resistance. When you step on it, the resistance goes down. They have a, 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 when it drops down so much, they know there's actually a weight on there, right? You understand? It makes the robot cut off. We wouldn't buy and sell on these things because these guys, they're not extremely accurate, right? You understand? All we know is their resistance goes, enough. but they're accurate enough for the, for the applications that they run in, and they're really cheap, right? Look, all I gotta have is what? Yeah, all I've got to have is this. Normally they use a screen type wire on the top and then they put a real thick pla a rubber mat on top of it. And then when I step on there, I'm, I'm connected to the two mesh screens that run across the top of the phone. And then I step on it and that's what we use them for. So we're not using them to weigh me, right? Yeah. We're just using them as presence detectors while we're trying to do. Okay. So this is homemade. By the way, this is what we call static foam. Uh, we have a lot of devices that we use in, in computers and digital that you can flat wipe them out with a stat with a with a static discharge. You can wipe them out with a static mm -hmm. discharge. So what we do is we come in and uh, store our devices on the side of one of these mats like this. So you'll you'll, you'll get a you get a bunch of integrated circuits and they'll be inside these things. You'll buy memory, they'll be inside them. And what it does, it's resistive and it don't allow the static to discharge. It, it makes the static bleed off, right? You understand? Well, this is actually a resistive foam uh, that we use for uh, static sensitive devices. Calibrate spring, static foam, and then uh, and then my PowerPoint in here. I don't 
have the PowerPoint yet. Yeah. So we do have semiconductor ports in. So what we do is we come up here, I don't set up the dot right? In case you can set it to us, that's all we do. Silicon silicon is a silicon oxide is a insulin. So all we have to do with silicon is just expose it to moisture type gas or steam. And then it will automatically build a layer of silicon oxide or dioxide, which gives us an insulator. Then we have the SI, which is silicon, and then we have the magnet. And then what we do is we come up here and we're basically technically creating a capacitor. Now, we talked a little bit about that. Uh, so, capacitors are rated in something called ferries. Mm -hmm. And what determines the amount of ferries? Does anybody know? Good. Good. So, the size of the plates. And the symbol, by the way, is... And this, I lost a job. I lost a job because of this. True story. I was in electronics, and this is the symbol of a capacitor uh, in motor controls. That's a symbol for what we call a normal open contact. <laughs> we were up in Huntsville. Uh, I forgot the name of the company. And then another guy went up and. Helping in the cab and it had a, the diagram on there. I don't know if I lost a job for that or not. They just didn't call me. <laughs> and he asked me what this was, and I said, "Well, it's a capacitor." But guess what it was? It was no other capacitor. Neither me or Bruce got called for the job, but that's okay. I wasn't moved. I'm glad I did because I didn't want to move to Huntsville anyway. Sometimes you got a straight line, and you got a. What they do is uh. This is the symbol I like to use. This is another symbol we use. This symbol right here, and I like to use this in our classes because why? Different. Yeah, it's different. It's this is actually the uh, symbol of a polarized capacitor. And that would be the positive plate. Polarized capacitors are are, are made with one plate is made of a material that likes to accept electrons. The other one is made of a material that likes to select positive charges. And what they do is it allows it, it allows the capacitor to have a bigger capacitance at, with a smaller size. So just about all your big, big, big capacitors, like your thousand, ten thousand microfarad capacitors, these are going to be these are going to be polarized. And they're usually called electrolytic or tantalum. We have two types of polarized capacitors. Uh, this is the symbol for a non-polarized capacitor, which means what? Yeah, you can put it, uh, this, if we put it on AC, it's no big deal. If we put it on DC, we have to honor the polarity. <coughs> this guy don't care. So if you actually looked at the uh, star capacitor for your HVA system, uh, it's going to be non-polarized. So it, don't, it works on AC or it will work on DC to do the same amount of capacitor. So what determines the amount of capacitance would be what? Yeah, the size of these guys. And then the material we use between them, which we call the dielectric. And, the, and then, well, the distance between the plane. So if I could come up here and I can take a capacitor and I could technically move the plates together 
And what would that do? That would cause the capacitance to go up. Uh, if I move them apart, the capacitance goes down. So we use this effect to, to measure them, which is basically what the solid state uh, guy is doing. Okay. This is div done different different ways. So there's a solid state pressure sensor, very very I mean sorry force sensor. So I might be able to get these, but uh, I'll, I, we don't have any money in our budget for the rest of the summer, so I won't be able to get this kind of here. I do have some uh, strain gauges over there that I'll bring over here next time. <coughs> now these are temperature sensors. And here we don't know. Uh, this is what we have. We have the strain gauge that looks like this. So what you're going to see is you're going to see just tons of little wires going back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, back there, right? And of course if we come over here and bend them, uh, we should see the resistance go up. If we flatten them out, we should see the wall resistance go down. We do have these over there. I'll bring them over next class. I don't think I, I. So, guys, that's our load sensor. Do you have any questions there? Regulation is we technically regulation is that where well, we remain a we maintain a constant output. Now that's perfect regulation. There's no such thing as perfect regulation. Right? We maintain a constant output. We change in load condition. Now regulated power supplies are really neat because they 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 actually allow the input to change and the output to change and the loads to change, and they still maintain a pretty constant output. So these guys actually are pretty neat. By the way, to get regulation, we have to have negative feedback, which means, and you could you could compare it to what your car does. So, if the speed of your car goes up, then your feedback's got to tell it to do what? Slow down. If your speed goes down, your feedback's got to tell it to do what? Go up. And we call that negative feedback. It don't mean it's a negative number. It just means it's in the opposite direction, right? In 